I'm done. <laughs> a wise man once told me that every speech should be like a woman's dress. It should be It should be long enough to cover all the basics, but short enough to keep your interest. <laughs> and I do not have ESP, but I do have ESPN. And a lot of you guys are thinking, Samuel Jackson is taller than Coach Carter. <laughs> well, Samuel Jackson is much taller, but I'm much better looking. And see, we are not human beings having a spiritual experience. We are spiritual beings having a human experience. And there's a difference between being broke and being poor. Being broke is just an economic condition. But being poor is a disabling frame of mind and a depressed condition of your spirit. You must vow never, ever to let your family, your church, your community ever be poor. And another thing, your family is supposed to borrow money from you and not pay you back. Look at the first two letters of family. F-A, that stands for financial aid. <laughs> and they say I'm from Macomb, Mississippi. Yes, but I'm from Fernwood, Mississippi. And as you're exiting the road going to Fernwood, Mississippi, at the top of this sign, it says, you are now entering Fernwood, Mississippi. And at the bottom of that same sign, it says, you're now leaving Fernwood, Mississippi. <laughs> and back in the day, we have to draw water out of the well, eat that red dirt. And people in Hollywood couldn't even remember my name, but they said, the real polite young man. The real polite. <laughs> so you have to be aggressive in life. <laughs> see, I like this. When you get a group of people, see, I can hit a guy that size, and he won't hit me back. <laughs> and see, personality has everything to do with having success. People are talking about what success is. See, if you only go fishing like twice in life and you're gonna to live to be 100 years old, you don't have 50 more years to go fishing. You just have one more time to go fishing. So what is success? What things happen in your life, the frequencies that they happen and how intense they are. See, illness is always on the parameter of your health plan. And it's always the most aggressive. It's always the most aggressive. But you get fall on the floor and do a push-up. Take some vitamins. You understand? And I ain't saying you got to go to no gym and work out every day. Please. As I get bigger, I just buy a bigger suit. <laughs> I ain't got time to be going to the gym doing all this workout. And another thing, all your life people have been telling you knowledge is power. Knowledge is not power. The execution of knowledge is power. And people are always talking about, oh, I want to make more money. I want to make more money. All the people you're talking to, I want to make more money. In Mississippi, when I was growing up, if we got a quarter, we was large. And my family was so broke when we lived in Mississippi here, honestly, that when we passed by a bank, it actually set off the alarm. <laughs> we was toe up from the flow up. But if you have a praying male mama, Oh, I'm telling you, it changes everything. So you got to go get it done. And I can't stand people who nag and complain all the time, all the way walking around nagging and complaining. If you want to get your future counsel, be a chronic nagger. People don't even want to be around you. They don't even want to be around you. See, you do not get paid by the hour. You get paid by the value you bring to the hour. If you're a problem solver, you're going to get paid. And people always say, I want to make money. The only people who make money in the United States work in Washington, D.C. at the U.S. Mint. <laughs> and my cousin Mookie in Fernwood. <laughs> he got his print machine going too. <laughs> the economy is always good. But see, this is a great thing. You must always do more than what you're paid for as an investment in your future. See, you can't be just do just enough. Because if you have a job, you just walk around like this. People have careers, they be running. They be ready to get things done. <laughs> see, 
You guys didn't know I was a boxer, did you? See, you guys just thought I was a coach. But see, I have seven sisters. You make my sisters cry, I'm coming to see you, partner. You understand? And if you've seen the movie, all of my plays are named after my seven sisters. My influence in life is through these ladies. It's amazing. My next book is called, you know, Listen to the Woman, period. Because if I wouldn't have, I'd probably be pumping gas or something somewhere. But my seven sisters played catch with me. I became a high school All-American and basketball and baseball. But you know what happened to me? That one of these things that changed the life? People think the movie changed my life. But it happened when I was seven years old. I came home, and you know how they had those gas tanks outside that you used to have to fill up for you to have cooking oil and stuff? Well, my mom didn't have enough, and she was preparing the meal, and my mom was crying. And the only arsenal I had, shall I say, the only weapon I had in my arsenal, I had the ability to write. And I used to carry a little sack to school. And believe it or not, Coach Carter started school uniforms. I had two pair of pants and two shirts the same color. <laughs> and at the time, people would say, that kid wear the same thing to school every time. But you know, 35 years later, they had school uniforms. I think I started that trend. <laughs> but I came home, and I was the first one home, and my mom was crying because she didn't have enough cooking oil to finish the meal. And I pull out my pad, well, it was paper at the time, and my pencil, and I wrote my mama this note. Mama, one day they're going to make a movie about me, and I'm going to buy you a big house and pay off all of your bills, and you'll never have to cry again, mama. Love, Kenny Ray. I was Kenny Ray before I was Coach Carter. <laughs> you know my mom kept that note for 35 years? 35 years, first day of filming the movie, my mama walked up to me and said, boy, make this come true. <laughs> And you guys are looking at me thinking, Coach Carter, did you buy your mama a big house? Yes, I did. Did you pay off all of her bills? No. My mama is an expensive girl. <laughs> so this thing, you got to have a pleasing personality. People in Hollywood cannot remember my name, but they said a young man who's extremely polite. People do business with people they like, period. You got to have a pleasing personality. How you doing, young man? Stand up, young man. Oh. <laughs> but see, even when you think there's a potential problem, there's always a solution. <laughs> see, that's what I'm telling you. See, because winter is going to come in your life. Winter is going to come. I don't know where I've met all of you guys, but winter is going to come. Winter is going to come. I don't care what you have achieved in life. Winter is going to show up. I used to coach the girls' basketball team. At Richmond High, no one wanted the job. And they said, this job was available. I couldn't wait. I was running. Man, I want the job. I want the job. They had won two games in 10 years. Everybody else looked at it like it was a problem. But see, I had a unique situation about young ladies. I grew up with seven of them. Think about it, they was all the same size. Mom and daddy leave to go to work. They would fight for 45 minutes. This my shirt, this my blouse. You're not wearing my shoes. Get dressed in five, we all catch the bus to school. Now, the girls' team. I knew that it was more important for the young ladies to get along with each other than to have a skill. The first six weeks of practice, we never shot one single shot. The balls was actually in the closet. I just let the girls sit in a circle and talk about their day. That was it. Because it was more important for them to get along than to have a skill. I understood that. Because, see, in the corridor, when you're trying to do something, you got to have a little experience. And I had a little experience. And so, therefore, I just let the girls get along and talk about their self. And two days before our first game, I pulled the balls out, and I said, let's practice. Now, what do you think happened to us, Jim? You see I have ESP. You didn't think I knew your name, did you, Jim? See, it's amazing. I bet your name Larry. I, I tell you, I'm so good at this. Now, what do you think happened in our first 16 basketball games? 
What do you think happened, Larry? Lobster and water kept going. <laughs> Listen to this. See, now, this is the way males, males think, right? <laughs> Dude, I have a movie. <laughs> they don't make movies about losers. Stand up. Let me. Lab, stand up. You don't have a heart condition or nothing, right? Not yet. All right, but you're going to have one. Don't, don't, look at this guy. Don't, look, don't he look impressive? Look how, look how he's just coming out like, look, don't, don't he look impressive? Don't, don't he look like what he's supposed to be? I'm in trouble now, I can tell. I'm just telling you. You're just, you're just dapper, man. That's what I'm saying. Thank you. You look cool. You got some swag. <laughs> See, everybody got to have swag, like you should have a theme song in your life. If Batman could have one and Robin could have one, you should have one. I like this rapper in Houston. It came out years ago, and I had went in the fifth ward of Houston and found this young man because he did the most incredible marketing job ever. He put his name in the song 5,000 times. <laughs> the whole song, and this is the way he did it. It was so cool. He just said, back in the day, you didn't want me. But now I'm hot, you all up on me. Mike Jones, Mike Jones. He just kept mentioning his name. And he put his cell phone number in his son. So when you call, he actually answered the phone. I said, this guy is a genius. I found But the great thing, when it's harvest time, it's time to harvest. See, in Mississippi, we used to have a mule. And you can only go from sun up to sun down. Now they have these big tractors that plow all day and all night. And a man don't even have to be on board. I'm looking at a farmer. I'm sitting there in Texas. This guy is sitting in his living room watching this tractor plow these acreage of land. I'm going like, my granddaddy would have really been impressed with this. <laughs> because that one plow with that mule, it was amazing. I mean. It is amazing. But guess what? Those humble beginnings made me the person that I am today. And when you talk about when people ask me where I'm from, I always say from Mississippi. I don't say from California. I always say I'm from Mississippi. <laughs> and so the greatest thing about this is we're all built to win. And see, we just need validation. And with the girls I had, they just needed validation. We won our first 16 basketball games, but I in implemented some of the greatest coaching techniques ever. After you receive a pass, and we pass the ball four times, no matter where you are, young lady, you shoot the ball. And they would be like this, one, <laughs> two, <laughs> three, and oh my God, it was Stephanie Sane, and it was her time, it was a fourth pass. And she got, and she was standing almost at the half court, and she said, oh my God, I gotta shoot. And we were yelling at her, shoot. And she just threw the ball. And the ball went in. I was the greatest coach ever. <laughs> now we get all the way to the state championship game my first year with the girls. And boy, we were proud. Now we start the game. And you're talking about winter showing up. After all this success, winter shows up again. My point guard would not pass the ball to my leading scorer. And I'm looking at her, going, girl, what's wrong with you? She went, Coach, I can't stand her. I said, what? She said, Coach, I can't stand her. Well, see, I had seven sisters. I understood. I said, what seems to be the problem? She said, she knew I was going to wear my red dress, and she wore hers. <laughs> OK. <laughs> She's 15 years old now. I put him back on the court. Guess what happened? She still wouldn't pass her the ball. There's four minutes left in the game. I call my final timeout. And as the young ladies were walking over towards me, I yelled, I said, pass the ball. Would you believe my entire, entire team started crying on the sideline? <laughs> they all started crying. And I'm going like, what's wrong with you guys? They went, well, coach, you didn't have to yell at her. <laughs> but see, I understood. I had seven, I understood all this. So guess what? Great coaches always implement great things when it's, when it's crucial. I said, young ladies, gather around. I said, there's a sale at the mall. <laughs> I said, after we win this game, I'm taking everybody shopping. We won that game by 10 points. <laughs>
<laughs> See, people just need to be validated. So the person to the right of you and to the left of you, shake their hand right now and say, I validate your ability to be successful. <laughs> is everybody validated? Hey, is everybody validated? Is everybody validated? Is everybody validated? That's what I'm talking about. <laughs> See, that's why you got to validate. See, that's how important it is. We have to validate people's lives. That's what we're doing here today. We're validating your, your life. I need you to meet 20 new people because all the people you know now can't, hurt, can't help you. You got to have some new blood in you. You got to meet some new people, Linda. So you guys just don't understand how I'll be knowing these things. Just, you know, it's just, uh, I bet your name's Joe. See, I am so good at this. See, but this is the great thing about this thing called life. You got to live it because you can't get out alive. Have you ever seen, honestly, a rental truck following a hearse? Can't take it with you. Period. And get a movie named after you. My family begs so much their hands look like cups. But that's a great thing. See, it's a great thing. We just got to get it done. See, I don't look at things as problems. It's just an opportunity for me to do better. Because you're going to always swing. You know, I'm not that type of guy who's standing at bat and just look for a walk. I swing at everything. I was All-American in baseball, too. I never walked my whole career. Because when it got 0-2, I'm swinging at that next pitch, period. Because every coach is going to tell you, oh, no, 3-0, and you take take. No, not me. That ball could be over my head. I'm swinging. <laughs> it was like the guy used to play catcher for the uh, Pittsburgh Pirates. His name was Manny Sanguin. See, you remember Manny Sanguin. He was a bad boy. And he used to strike out all the time and, and all the time. He swung at all these bad pitches and, and he was from Cuba. And they always said, why do you swing at so many pitches? He said, you can't walk your way off that island. <laughs> <laughs> You got to hit your way off that island. So with you, you got to miss every shot you don't take. So you got to take the shots. You got to be on ready, ready. That's what I tell my team. You got to be on ready, ready. You got to be on ready, ready. So when life comes along, you got to be ready. You can't be getting ready. You got to be ready. See, I just figured out all seven of my sisters are dyslexic. I couldn't believe this, man. All seven of my sisters are dyslexic. With their husband's credit card, they go to the mall, they're in there five minutes. They get mines. It's amazing. And so I give them my credit card to go to the YMCA to work out, right? Because over the years, they have lost about 5,000 pounds, but they find them back every year. <laughs> so I give them my credit card to go to the YMCA to work out. They're dyslexic. They end up at the mall at Macy's. <laughs> <laughs> See, they explained that to Earl. See, that just went right over. <laughs> You know this young man. That's your husband. How did you get so lucky, Earl? That ain't even enough for you now. Come on now. You got to tell me something else, Earl. How long have you guys been married? You got married uh, February the 14th. On Valentine's Day? Yeah. Would you believe that that's my, almost my birthday? <laughs> but that's good. See, I, I take all those bad things I was thinking about you, Earl, because of your your relationship with this young lady. Look how she's properly, look how she's dressed. Stand up, young lady. See, I just like when ladies put themselves together. Stand up, look how she's dressed. Got on her power blue. And look at all this stuff, this big old ring on the stuff. Earl, you're doing pretty good. Hey, listen, hey, are you, are, are you a rapper or something? Look at all this bling she have on. She have on a Mr. T starter kit. <laughs> Earl, you're doing a good job, young man. See. People do business with people they like. You got to have a pleasing personality. See, like I walk over here and just hit this young man. He won't hit me back because he likes me, see? <laughs> but if you are unlike, people will go to the end of the earth to get you. Oh, they will go to the end. Of, Mike, you know how it is. Andrew, they know how it is. They'll go to the end of the earth to get you. Now, you know I'm going to hit you, John. Now, get your chest out. Get your chest out. Stick your chest out. 
You're a Mississippi young man. I know you're tough, right? No hard conditions or nothing like that, right? I was born in New York. So. You born in New York? Oh, I know you're tough. <laughs> See, this is the way life is. Life's going to come along and it's going to be swinging to hit you. You got to be ready. You understand? You got to be ready. You can't be passive. I can't stand passive people. Oh, it irks me. Man, it just irks me. I didn't know you guys had so many celebrities here today. Bill Gates is here. Come here. Look at him. Come here, Gates. Look at him. Come on up here. Come on, Gates. So y'all didn't know Bill Gates was here. How you doing? I'm doing pretty good. How's, is there any new products coming out or anything? I don't know. I don't know. Got some great products down in Hattiesburg. You should come visit. Oh, in Hattiesburg. Yeah. Is that in the United States? Oh, yeah. Is that University of Southern Mississippi is there, right? Mm -hmm. You know what? I spent some summers there shooting hoop. My junior and senior year, I spent that summer, I spent in there in that gym shooting hoop. I didn't know you was on campus, young man. Yes, sir. But how did you get to Washington? Washington? Yeah. I Probably think that's where your big mansions, you know, you own half the island, right? I don't know, but if you can get me those bank account numbers, that'd be good. All right. <laughs> <laughs> see, you see. This guy is a shy, you would think he was the shyest guy in the world, but you see him, you get him up, and he likes me. See how he goes along? See, that's what I'm telling you. You will get blessed if you step up and step out. You got to dress up and show up, and then you got to show out. Don't people don't like this. Oh, look at her. She's tight. We got, stand up. Look, shut up. <laughs> Come on out here. Look at this. Oh, she, now this woman got blamed. Come on out here. I didn't know Marilyn Monroe was still around. <laughs> look at her. Look at her. Look at her. In that case, let me take my glasses off. Look at, look at her. So look at she. This is her presentation to life. When you get up in the morning, you're going to make a presentation. So you got to be ready. Success come knock on the door and you go, oh, check with me tomorrow. Oh. Rarely do a great idea interrupt you. You got to go looking and searching. Good job. Well, thank you, sir. I look at it. it. Good job. Look, look at look. Are you a rapper? No, sir, I'm not, but my husband is. I think I think my so. Look at it. Good job. I, I know he's doing a good job. Thank I you. thought you were like hanging out with Snoop Dogg or something. You know, look at it. You know he's from Macomb too. People don't know his parents are from Macomb. Snoop Dogg is from Macomb. You understand? So we all made it in LA and you know, and it's funny, all us Mississippi guys get together and we start telling stories. And everybody always try to tell a worse story. How times were so bad, you know what I mean? And I tell them like this. I said, my life in Mississippi as I was growing up was tough. And you know, and, and, and when they talk about trials and tribulations, I said, the Dead Sea was just sick. <laughs> that ends that conversation. They said, Coach, we don't have no conversation for that one. That's pretty good. But see, what I'm telling you is simply this. You got to always do more than what you're paid for as an investment in your future. And you got to be tough. You can't be passive. You got to take the shot. Please hit me the ball. When I play baseball, please hit me the ball. Because if you're one of those people say, oh, don't hit me the ball, guess where, they, where the ball is going to go? Directly to you. So you got to be ready. You got to be ready. You got to be ready. And I used to be telling them, hit it over here, you out. When I play football, you run over here, I'm going to twist your head off. <laughs> Listen, and that's the way I play. I play with an attitude. You understand? That's the way I live my life. That's the way it is. If you know me, look at the circles under my eyes. Those were all the fights I didn't win. <laughs> but I was in them, though, and I always threw the first punch. See, you can't be passive. You can't go through life being passive. You got to be ready to play this thing called life. You got to be ready to play. Now, in playing this game, you got to be smart. You got to have a plan, and you got to write it down. If you write things down, they're 10 times more likely to come true. That's a proven fact. So if you plan your day the night before, people won't steal your time because that's your most valuable asset. You can't let people steal your time, your friends. And not being organized, you lose a lot of time. So all you guys commute. You need to be listening to a tape or something in the car. You got to have some bread for the head. You understand? You got to be working all the time. I don't ever want to retire. Please. Why? They said now one in three of us are going to live to be 100 years old. So you got to get to living. Make your life count. You know what I mean? 
And so I'm a coach, you know, and that's what I like doing. I coach. My mama even called me coach. I like that. I like coaching. Man, it's good. And so because you can see the development of a young person. See, kids are one third of our population, but they're 100 percent of our future. And if we don't do a good job, I won't get my Social Security check. <laughs> I'm paid a lot into it. And so in the clip that you see, that gentleman was named Cruz. He was selling drugs and stuff. And now, this June, that gentleman will be a medical doctor. Changed his life totally. Now, after we win the tournament with the, with, the, with the girls, guess what? I got an opportunity to coach the boys. We had no nets, no balls, no shoes, no nothing. But that didn't matter. We didn't even have towels. But that didn't really matter because the showers didn't work anyway at the school. <laughs> but this is the thing, it never bothered me. And kids used to always wear their hat backwards. So I used to go talk to the back of their head. <laughs> I said, well, you're wearing your hat backwards. I thought that's the way you was walking. But this is the thing, I take over the males program and guess what happens? Man, we start playing, but let me tell you about this kid named Worm. He used to always say, coach, put me in the game. Coach, put me in the game. You guys didn't know my twin brother was here today. Come here, let me show you. See this? I got all the good looks. I don't know what happened to him. <laughs> don't he look like he's successful? You just look like what you're supposed to be. So, some people just look like what they're supposed to be. You feel me? They just look successful. You understand? Notice I said look. <laughs> but good job. But in coaching these boys, this was happening. I had to implement a new plan. Now, Richmond High, 50% of the kids who enter Richmond High School never ever graduate, period. And you were 80 times more likely to go to jail. I did not say eight, 80 times more likely to go to jail than you were to go to college, unless you played for Coach Carter. I have a 100% graduation rate, and every senior who've ever played for me have gone on to college. I'm really proud of that. Now we're coaching the boys. I have them sign a contract. They want what? No, you have to sign a contract to play for me. Period. And guess what? Your mama and them got to sign it too. But see, that wasn't enough. Because sometime in California, the, the, the kid and the parent party at the same club. So I had the grandmama and the grandfather sign it too. I said, somebody should be home by 12. But with the boys, we started implementing this with the boys. And Worm kept saying, Coach, put me in the game. Coach, put me in the game. Put me in the game, Coach. Because I used to tell him, you have to be on the gas. You can't be on the break all the time. You ain't going nowhere. Cynthia? Is that Kathy? You sure? <laughs> you sure you know your name? I'm renaming you. I'm just messing with you. See that? See, when you mess with people, they like it. She, she, she smiled at me. See, that's what I'm trying to tell you. When you go to ask your boss for a raise, he must like you. So he's going to say no. You feel me? So this is how this works. Worm kept saying, Coach, put me in the game. So I put Worm in the game. Let me give you statistics in one minute and 30 seconds. Worm had taken four shots, missed all four of them. He had turned the ball over twice and they committed four fouls, all in a minute and 30 seconds. I couldn't wait to get him out of the game. He ran by me, coach, you gonna put me back in? <laughs> he said, coach, you gonna put, I said, well, get to the end of the bench. And we playing, and that's an NBA player who's playing actually tonight. He was killing us. And my all-American Courtney Anderson, who's junior battle from the movie, fouled out of the game. And I'm walking up and down the bench, because I'm a pacer and I'm looking for somebody to put in the game. You know not one single person wanted to go in the game? Because they were scared we were gonna, I want to be on the court when we lose. So I'm looking up and down the court, and the referee comes over and says, Coach Carter, you have 15 seconds. If you don't put somebody in the game, we're going to call you your technical. So I grabbed a young man, and I was walking, and I'm pacing, and I turned around. Guess who I bumped into? Worm. Worm, Worm said, put me in the game, Coach. I grabbed Worm like that. I said, come here, Worm. And I'm tough because all the cameras on us and stuff, championship game. I mean, it's, 
state championship. I'm ready. We boys hadn't won a game the year before. And now we're in the state championship. Man, I'm ready and I'm fired up and I'm getting it done. And there's three minutes left in the game and Worm hadn't made a shot all night. And I grabbed Worm, I said, Worm, you ain't got no heart condition or nothing, right? No. Okay, good. So I have to ask. So I'm looking at him, I said, Worm, the school needs you. The community needs you. The team needs you. <laughs> I just like hitting big guys. <laughs> no, stay I said, Worm, I want you to get out there and get ferocious. And I pushed him, and Worm was like this. He was going like, I said, Worm, get out there and get ferocious, boy. He was going, I said, Worm, get out there and get ferocious. And he looked at me and said, Coach, is ferocious on our team? <laughs> he looked at me, he said, is ferocious on our team, coach? And what is his number? <laughs> See, I should have known I had an academic problem there, right? <laughs> Let me tell you what Worm did that night. This NBA player who's playing tonight, Worm held him down to zero points. Worm scored eight points himself, and we won another championship. I learned a very valuable lesson. I learned a very valuable lesson from that young man that night, and it was simply this, that successful people would go from one failure to the next enthusiastically, because the only one believed in the worm that night was worm, because <laughs> I truly did. <laughs> I was looking for my grandmother. I said, Grandmother, come here. Go stop that guy. I'll help you with your makeup afterwards. I was looking for anything, but the young man stepped up. And see, this is the thing. Not all of us can become famous but each and every one of us can become great because greatness is defined by the service that we give to others. You gotta give great service, period. Now, I want to ask you, Mr. Blake, all the insurance is paid up? Yes. You sure? I'm fine. Oh man, this is so cool. I want everybody to stand up. Stand up right now. Man, that is so cool. Now. I want everybody, I guess I have to get on stage now. Everybody, I want you to raise both of your hands over your head. What a photographer, at. that's such a great thing. Let me take a picture there. Keep them hands up. You look smart. These two kids out here look really smart. Where do you guys go to school? I know you're students. You're not? Y'all look so young. Wait, what? Well, what do you guys do, may I ask? Where at? Delta State. Delta State, Cleveland, Mississippi. Wow. See, you just got a free plug. They just trying to get free plug. <laughs> Let me take this. What a photographer. Oh, get that. Good job. You got it. Keep those hands up. Keep those hands high. Now, take your right hand and put over your heart. Your right hand, young man. <laughs> he said he left-handed. Okay, that'll work. Now I want you to turn 360 degrees all the way around. Now, you can put your hands down. When anybody asks you, how was Coach Carter presentation here in Jackson, Mississippi? That's what I want you to tell him. He made me rise to my feet, raise both of my hands. He touched my heart, and he turned me around. Hey! <laughs>